Today we're going to go over chapter three in uh, mathematical proofs um, book, and it'll be a general overview of the chapter uh, <clears throat> for an asynchronous day, I guess. So, chapter three is all about. Direct proof and proof by contrapositive. Uh, there are other minor cases than those, but those are the two major um, proof techniques that that we're going to introduce in this chapter. Uh, before we get started, let me do a, a quick introduction into some of the um, terminology uh, that goes along with you know proofs and and uh, theorems and stuff like that so uh, for instance terminology uh, a theorem that's going to be a um, or, sorry, we're, not, we're skipping it. We're going to talk about an axiom first. Axiom, uh, this is a mathematical statement that you hold to be true without proof. So this is a mathematical statement held to be true without proof. Uh, it's like they're the hypotheses um, that you assume to, you know, build your entire framework of math on top of. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about how many axioms are necessary to, uh, to you know, build a mathematical theory on. Uh, there are some, uh, and these are mostly set theory uh, e examples uh, or axioms. Um, for example, the axiom of choice is a act is an axiom that is somewhat uh, controversial because it can actually lead to um, paradoxes in uh when when you right when you cut up a set in a really weird way um it's quite possible to cut up the set into pieces um where the original set had volume say one and the then you put those pieces back together again and now the volume is two which is like so weird but for example the axiom of choice is an axiom. And what is that axiom? It says that uh, if if I'm given a set uh, or a collection of sets, then I might be able to choose one element from each uh, piece, from each collection. So this is seems quite clear like if you have a bunch of non-empty sets you should be able to pick one element from each one if you want um and so it, it's contra not controversial in statement this might be controversial in how it leads to uh a paradox later but uh yeah I, i'm <sighs> I'm not going to go there. So theorem, what is a theorem? A theorem is any state, any results that can be verified or proven using only axioms, definitions, or previously verified theorems or results. Uh, and you can do that by a series of logically valid steps. Okay, result that and be verified, aka proven. Um, 
logically using axioms, definitions, previously verified theorems, results. Okay, uh, there's a lot of examples of theorems. Some of the most famous ones are, you know, have special names like fundamental theorem of calculus um, is a big one. Uh, the intermediate value theorem. Okay, a bunch. A anything that is kind of a major result. So I would say I wouldn't call every result that you can, you know, technically that's the definition of a theorem, but I wouldn't call every result that you can verify in a, a, a theorem, right? There are sort of minor uh, theorems, and those would be something like, uh, you can also have propositions, observations, okay, or examples. Um, those, those will be other ways that, you know, this will be theorems. They're like theorems, but their, their proof is less important or their result is less important. And um, so, I don't know. You don't want to call everything that you can prove a theorem. It, it, that's sort of reserved uh, stylistically for the major results, okay? But... There's also something called a corollary. So this is uh, specifically a theorem um, or proposition or an observation that derives directly from another uh, theorem. So as a result, that follows directly um, another proven result. For instance, uh, there's a corollary to the intermediate value theorem um, that's called Rolle's theorem. Okay, even though uh, it is its own. results that, you know, was proven separately. So we call it Rolle's theorem, but this is a special case of the intermediate value theorem is a corollary to the intermediate value theorem uh, because it is just a special case. Okay, the intermediate value theorem says that uh, if you have a continuous function that's differentiable, uh, you know, continuous on a closed interval, differentiable on an open interval, um, then, you know, the, in, there is an instant, there is a, a derivative of the function whose value is equal to the, uh, the average rate of change of the function over the entire interval. Okay. Rolle's theorem is like that if uh, the, the average rate of change equals zero. Okay. But I'm going to go too more far into this. The lemma is another example of a theorem or a result that can be proven. But this is, this is a helping result. Okay. Often it's harder to prove than the theorem that that it, uh, you know that the corollary of a lemma, for instance, becomes the theorem because it is a better um, uh, statement or easier to apply statement. But the helping result uh, 
um, that can be used to verify uh, a, another theorem. Okay. There's a, it's often a technical result. So, for example, right, um, the theorem that we are uh, trying to prove is that the derivative of um, the sine is cosine, but the lemma is that um, is that Cosine theta is less than sine theta over theta, which is less than one for all theta in, say, zero to two uh, uh, pi over two. Maybe uh, we don't want to divide by zero, so. So in this way, we can use the squeeze theorem to find that the limit of sine theta over theta is one. And then we can use that. So that's like the theorem. And then we can use that to show that the, the derivative of sine is cosine. So anyway, it, this is a result. It's very important to show this result. But um, it, to state it as the theorem is just kind of, uh, it, it doesn't immediately show the significance. That's what uh, the lemma, that's when you would call it. Okay. And then, um, just if we, this whole thing, some terminology. OK, and then uh, generally speaking, what we're going to talk about is a direct proof okay, versus a contrapositive. OK, a direct proof, this is um, you know, to show P implies Q, you can we assume P, then uh, show P implies Q1, Q1 implies Q2, so where, uh, and so on. Qn implies Q, right? So it basically, we are trying to show uh, that there's a sequence of statements, Qi, that kind of tell us, well, right, if P is true, then, then Q1 is true. And if Q1 is true, then Q2 is true. This is like sort of step-by-step -step process until we arrive at the uh, the final value Q and, you know, generally uh, we're doing this over a domain. So we're, you know, it's a quantified statement for all X in So we assume that P is true for some arbitrary value of X. Okay. And then we show that Q is true. On the other hand, contrapositive this is a direct proof as well, but it's a direct proof of, you know, a different statement. Not Q implies not P. Okay, so this is this is a way 
to show that P implies Q. What's going on here? Yeah, we have an event Okay, uh, I'm 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 videoing a, a lecture here. So. Yeah, it's all good. All right, no problem. Thank you. Uh, I freaking knew that was going to happen. So annoying. Um, it's a way to show that P implies Q indirectly, right? Uh, because this implication, not Q implies not P, is uh, logically equivalent to uh, P implies Q. All right. Okay, before we get to, to some examples of those, we're going to do um, one little business here, trivial uh, and vacuous. So recall uh, that the truth table for an implication goes this way, right? P. Okay, the only place where the implication is false is it when the the hypothesis is true, but the the um, the conclusion is false, right? So vacuous proofs are ones when if you just want to verify that P is false for all X. P of X implies Q of X. P of X is false. For all X, then it doesn't matter what Q of X is. The, this statement is true. You would say that's true vacuously, right? Because here we're talking about the vacuous is in red, right? So when P is false, it doesn't matter the uh, implication is true, no matter what the cube is, right? And then if Q is true for all X, then the, the uh, statement is true trivially. That is like a trivial proof. So if you are able to show that um, the conclusion is always true, no matter what, okay. So on the one hand, we got red goes with both those and then blue or orange goes with the other ones. Okay, anyway. Um, so 
these these are like for instance um the integer n is odd implies 17 is less than 20 or uh, let R be a positive rational number prove that if r squared plus one over r is equal to one, then r squared plus two over r is less than or equal to two. Note that we are not trying to show that r squared plus two over r is less than or equal to two. We are trying to prove this implication, right? So in the first one, right, this is always true, right? So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the uh, hypothesis was. P implies Q. If Q is always true, then P implies Q is always true. On the other hand, here, R squared plus one over R is never equal to one uh, for any rational number. So what? Why is that? Well, um, R squared uh, plus one over R say were equal to one. That would mean that R squared minus R plus one was equal to zero for a rational number, which it's not. Okay, um, so we we this would be a vacuous proof. We would have to verify that, right? That this is wanted to do a vacuous proof. We would have to say why that statement is always false. Um, thing here, the, of course, that's pretty easy. 17 is less than 20. Okay, so the only thing left to verify when you want to the only thing left to verify if you're trying to show a an implication is this last one um well uh if p is true and q is false that's when the implication is false right so we will consider this uh guy here We do proof by contradiction. So in, in proof by contradiction, we're going to be like, oh, well, suppose P is true and Q is false. In other words, suppose that the implication is false. Then show that uh, that leads to some logical paradox or a contradiction. So in other words, it couldn't be the case that P is true and Q is false. And so therefore, uh, we fall into one of these other cases where the implication is true, okay? So note that um, what we're gonna do with a direct proof is if we already know that Q is true, then we have a trivial proof. If we already know that P is false, we have a vacuous proof. So the only thing left to verify that's necessary is 
assume that P is true and then show that Q is true. Since uh, Q of X equals false, no, it equals true. For all X uh, gives us a trivial proof. And P of X is false. For all X gives us a vacuous one. Um, we need only consider the X values in S where P of X is true. And then show that Q of X is true for that same value. Okay. So that's what a direct proof is. So let me just do some examples. So you can see how it works. And you'll be able to. Fill in the details. Um, okay, so proof. If N. Is an even integer. Then n times n plus one times n minus one plus one is an odd integer. So we're going to have to decide whether we're going to do this directly or by contrapositive. And since we're in the direct proof, section we're going to do it directly but we know that's the case because look the p is n is an even integer right a q is like some expression in n okay so the first one is easier in some sense Right? Less complicated. So we're going to assume N is even. And that, that means N is of the form 2K, where K is an integer. That's what it means to be even. You're divisible by 2. OK, then we plug what the formula is for n into that expression. So we get 2k times 2k plus 1 times 2k minus 1 plus 1. So is of the form. Two times an integer. plus one, which is odd. But K times 2K plus one times 2K minus one uh, is an integer. So two times that, let's say this is um, L. Two times L plus one must be odd. Okay. Another example. Um.
It, it, well, I mean, it turns out actually this result could be made stronger. Okay. This thing n times n plus one times n minus one plus one is an odd integer for any integer, turns out. Okay. We would have to show that by doing it in cases, which is a thing that we, we do at the end of this chapter. First, you would assume that n was even, we do this one. Then you would assume that n was odd and do do a uh, similar thing. So you can add, uh, you can make this the the uh, statement stronger if you wanted to. But uh, what if I said, you know, let or to prove if n is an odd integer. Then n squared is an odd integer. Okay. Suppose n is odd, then, or uh, well, let's do it this way. Uh, I think maybe you have a homework problem like this. This is even. Okay. So once again, n squared minus one is like an expression in uh, the variable n that's more complicated than the thing in p. So I, I would do a direct proof there. So our little trick is if you are saying something is an odd integer, then it must be of the form 2k plus 1 for some k. Then, oh, sorry, n squared minus 4. Tons of emails. Keep me alone. 2k plus 1 squared minus 1, and then I would just foil it all out. 4k squared plus 4k plus 1 minus 1 is equal to 2 times 2k squared plus 2k, right, is even. Since K is an integer means that 2K squared plus 2K is an integer, right? Which means the uh, expression is of the form two times an integer, and that is even. Section 3.3, we have proof by contradiction or proof by contrapositive. And this is just a, a um, another way to prove a, a implication, but sort of backwards, right? So to prove E implies Q, we could instead prove not Q implies not P using a direct proof. So this uh, statement, not Q implies not P, is the contrapositive of, that's sort of the definition of what a contrapositive is, is the contrapositive of P implies Q. Quote, unquote, contrapositive statement.
of the implication E implies Q is the statement not Q implies not P. So a proof by contrapositive is, in other words, a direct proof of the contrapositive. And we would use this when the uh, statement Q is less complicated than the statement P. For example, let X be an integer. Okay, so that's the domain. If 5X minus 7 is even, then X is odd. You can tell right away that this is less complicated. Uh, than than the uh, the hypothesis, right? And then this one's more complicated. It is possible to do this uh, proof directly, but um, a proof of contrapositive is easier. Um, we will proceed using a proof by contrapositive. Note that adding that that sentence is not necessary usually, but um, you know when you start out, right? You want to be very clear. Okay. So we're going to assume that x is not odd. In other words. Assume that X is even. Then X is, oh, that should be a capital one. X is of the form 2K. And so 5X minus 7 is 5 times 2K. Uh, Minus seven. And so that is two times five K uh, plus four, no, no, plus three, plus two, okay, minus four. Inside the parentheses of plus one, which is of the form of an odd integer. Now, here is a theorem, theorem. 3.12, okay, this says, let X be an integer, then the integer X squared is even if and only if X is even. Okay, so this is a bi bijective statement, right? Um, so we need to prove both directions. And when you have to prove an if and only if, at least initially, one direction or one of those statements, right? You have to first show P implies Q and then you have to show Q implies P, okay? So one of those directions, like this direction, for instance, so P implies Q, 
we're going to do this by contrapositive. Right, since x squared is more complicated than x. But the the converse, right, we can do. Directly, OK, so. Uh, one of the directions in the proof of the bijective statement should be direct proof and one of them should be contrapositive because that is, you know. Best way to do this one. All right, uh, so here. Let X be odd, right? Since that's not even, then X is 2K plus one for some K. That's an integer, then. Thus, uh, X squared is 2K plus one squared, which is. Um, Oh, yeah, uh, 4K squared plus 4K plus 1, which is 2 times 2K squared plus 2K plus 1 is odd. Right, so that means that if X is odd, then X squared is, is odd. On the other hand here, if X is even, then X is equal to 2K, and so X squared is uh, 2K all squared is also one. OK, so we show both uh, directions. All right, uh, the last section in this chapter is called a proof by cases. I'm going to let you uh, as the. The reader or student go ahead and, and um, read up about this. Essentially, this is saying. Uh, this is proof by cases is if you want to show. For all X in S P of X implies Q of X. It is sometimes advantageous to break up the the uh, domain into uh, into pieces. Break up S into a partition. Remember what that uh, is from previous chapter, OK? So we're going to partition the, the thing into uh, some uh, collection of non-empty sets. Okay, S1, S2, up to S. L um, and then prove P of X implies Q of X for X in S1 and in S2 and in S3 up to S L. I'll do those all separately. So for instance, Show that n times 2n plus 1 times 2n minus 1 plus 1 is odd. All integers n. OK. So proof we would do case 1 is let n be even. OK, so that is the thing we proved up here.
Yeah, right here. OK, so this would be the proof of case one. The above for proof. Then case two is we're going to let N be odd. OK, and we just get so. N times two. Uh, so that's supposed to be two N. And minus one is uh, 2k plus one times two times 2k plus one times two times 2k plus one minus one. Okay. Boil it all out, right? This is going to be of the form 2l. Uh, no, not, not use l there. 2k plus one, 2u. Plus one for some integer u. Uh, I'm not going to do out those details. Okay, so that's where I'm going to stop here. Um, if you have any questions, just email me. See ya.